All right, well, this evening, let me just simply read a passage of Scripture, a couple of verses that deal with the last point that we're going to be looking at. Remember, the first two points are going to be basically applications of the first three that we saw this morning. So what I'd like to do is read uh, John 13, verses 34 and 35. This is what Jesus says to his disciples in the upper room discourse as he is preparing to, to leave them and equipping them for uh, the work that he is leaving them in the world to do. He says in verse 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, as we noted this morning, we saw that the Lord calls us to be ready to defend the faith. Remember, Peter said, be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that is within you to everyone who asks. We are to give a defense, as it were, an argument for the truth of the gospel. And remember, it's not because uh, we're led to believe by Scripture that we can argue anyone into the kingdom of heaven, but rather because it can shake people loose from their own self-deceptions or the deceptions that uh, the enemy has, has put within this world long enough for, for them to give the gospel a hearing. Uh, again, breaking down the shields, breaking down the walls that stand between us and communicating the gospel to others. Now, we saw the call to do that this morning. We, we've already actually considered why it is we need to do that, and that's because of the sin within man that is suppressing the knowledge of God, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, and also because the enemy is sowing uh, his lies in the world, and he is very good at deception. Now, we've also looked at the three, three main approaches that have been used historically to defend the gospel. And, and I, I should mention that, uh, as I did this morning, there aren't only three, but these are perhaps three of the main ways the church has defended the gospel. The first one is the evidential approach that has been championed by such apologists as uh, Josh McDowell that seeks to show the, the many things that are in the Bible that are unique, that basically, uh, well, prove or show that this is God's Word, that really uh, show that really you can't explain any other way than that God is the author of it. And we saw the different things, uh, and even our confession points out, the Bible actually contains many things that uh, show it to be the Word of God. It's essentially self-evidencing, we might say. Um, okay, so that was the, the evidential approach, again, from um, uh, just the unity of what the authors say, uh, from the, uh, uh, the prophecies in particular that have been fulfilled that were spoken of many centuries uh, beforehand. Uh, we saw, secondly, the uh, classical approach that has been championed in history by such men as Anselm and Aquinas, and more recently by uh, John Gerstner and R.C. Sproul, that seeks to show that God exists, that the Bible is his word, through uh, a more rational way of arguing, uh, using the evidence that God has given in the creation and uh, through reason to demonstrate what God actually says he demonstrates, again, through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, that he exists. I mean, God has given basically an apologetic to his word already. It shows itself to be the word of God. He's given the entire world an apologetic to his existence uh, in the creation. But again, knowing how God actually does that through the creation can be a very powerful tool in demonstrating that to others. Again, everybody sees it, everybody uh, knows that God exists, that revelation actually gets through, it's, it's, uh, it comes through the creation. Uh, so they're already without excuse, but again, because of the suppressing of this knowledge, because of sin, seeking to tear down the knowledge of God, it's useful for us to know how God does this, 
and to develop arguments from it and to use it to help others sort of shake them loose from their particular worldview. And then we saw, thirdly, there is the presuppositional approach that has been championed by such men as Cornelius Van Til, Greg Bonson, and John Frame, that again seeks to show that God exists and the Bible is his word by, by showing that the contrary is really impossible. God must exist, the Bible must be his word, otherwise there's really no grounds for reason itself. There's certainly no grounds for existence. There's no reason for existence. God has to be the grounds of this. There's no grounds for our ability to think or to communicate. All of this is based upon the fact that God actually exists and the fact that people who don't believe in him use these things is really just um, as well as the presuppositional camp would say that they're using borrowed capital. They're actually assuming also the existence of a rational universe which could only exist if God actually exists. So the presuppositional apologetic seeks to show that that it's impossible that God couldn't exist. Okay. Now we noted that John Frame also holds that each of these approaches, evidentialism, classical apologetics, and presuppositional apologetics can really all work together in what he would consider a presuppositional framework or use it for a presuppositional argument because everyone who argues in any of these camps uh, already holds to the fact that God exists and that the Bible is his word as their basic assumptions and because they assume these things to be true in the arguments that they're using. Again, nobody technically re really can open their mouths and speak words that, that make sense unless God exists. And so the assumption is already there. That's what they're seeking to prove, that God exists. Now, this method, I think, that, that we talked about in, in presuppositionalism in particular, but I think it's also true in the other camps as well, uh, works in this way. First of all, they seek to show the inconsistency of the opponent's view. Remember how we said this morning that everyone has their basic assumptions about reality, their basic presuppositions. And whatever it is that they see in the world, whatever it is they seek to interpret is always going to agree with those basic assumptions that they have about reality. The evolutionist is going to, you know, uh, interpret all reality on the basis of his, of his commitment to evolution. When he goes out looking for age because he believes that there has to be long periods of time for evolution to take place, he's going to find it because that is really what he believes. So this approach would first of all attack, as it were, uh, the opponent's basic assumptions or presuppositions to show them the inconsistency of those things, to show them that those really are not valid uh, assumptions to have. And then after you've shaken them out of their particular position, invite them into your worldview to show them the consistency uh, of the biblical worldview that only God can explain everything that we see and experience. So basically destroy the opponent's presuppositions and then invite him to adopt yours, at least to be able to look at your worldview to show him uh, that your view is consistent, his is inconsistent. As a matter of fact, the biblical worldview is the only consistent worldview. Now this evening I thought maybe we could look at just two examples of how to apply this particular approach uh, to defending the gospel. And what I wanted to do is first of all just revisit what Ravi Zacharias had to say last week as we watched that video in, in his refutation of the prevailing philosophy today which is postmodernism. I'm not sure how many of you remember what he had to say. And again, this is getting a bit technical, but I did hear a lot of people say, many of you say, you really enjoyed that video, right? You really enjoyed what he had to say. Well, then you should really enjoy this because we're going to go over it again, what he had to say. But what I want us to do is look at his methodology and see what it is he did and then see maybe how we can go a bit beyond that, which I think he would do uh, when he's ministering to, uh, you know, to people as, as he does.
But then secondly, we want to use this methodology against an evolutionary worldview to see how we address people who believe in evolution because that's really the main argument against Christianity, against supernatural creation, is that it's all purely accidental. And then I want us to close by looking at something that all of us can be involved in, which is perhaps even more powerful than all of these arguments. And that is if we love one another the way that Jesus calls us to love one another the way that he actually loved us. So first of all, let's get a little bit technical by looking at the example that uh, Ravi Zacharias gave us last week in his defense against postmodernism. Now, he began by giving us, first of all, the three main principles, and these are their basic assumptions, their presuppositions. First of all, he said they believe that there is no objective reference for words. In other words, words are meaningless. They can mean anything, okay? There, there isn't a specific uh, thing that any word is pointing to. Now, we have to understand how detrimental that is to the idea of knowledge to begin with because remember words, what words are, they're just symbols. You know, I'm, I'm using words right now and as I'm using the wor these words, I'm communicating ideas because each of these words symbolizes either a thing or an action or something else. And as I put these words together in particular sentences and so forth, I'm conveying meaning. Now, what they're saying is that words have no set meaning. Words can be stripped of, of their historic sense, how we have traditionally used them, and they can be given a new significance, whatever the speaker desires. He can use, he can or she can use them any way they want to convey anything that they want. So that's the first principle of postmodernism. Secondly, he said that there are no rules of logic that can explain the relationship between things or even concepts. He says all of these principles, all these laws of logic can be questioned, they can be denied. There's, there's, there's nothing set. So words don't mean anything and there's no relationships that, that basically are established between different ideas or concepts. And then thirdly, he said there are only individual truths. There is no overarching truth. There is no system of truth, no ultimate meaning. He called it the meta-narrative, which for Christians is, of course, God and the plan of God and the gospel and salvation and so forth. So there's no system, there's no truth that ties all these individual, individual truths together. They just exist as individual truths. Now, the problem, of course, with that view is it's wrong. But as long as somebody holds that particular view... They're not going to listen to the gospel. They're going to use these principles to tear the gospel apart and say that what you're saying, what I'm saying, is absolute meaningless because the gospel teaches an ultimate truth, that God exists. Everything exists for his glory. There's heaven and hell. There's a work of redemption. There is ultimate truth because it is logical. There is a relationship between the words and these concepts that actually makes sense. And it can be communicated in words, it must be communicated in words that have specific meanings. So as long as somebody holds to these different principles of postmodernism, they really have an argument or an, uh, an excuse not to believe what it is that we have to tell them. They think they do. They have no excuse, really, but that, they, that's what they think they have. So Ravi Zacharias began by showing the inconsistency, logical inconsistency of their position. He attacked their presuppositions, their basic assumptions. They say that words don't refer to anything specific. But he pointed out that they use words, lots of words, to explain and defend their particular philosophy. And they expect us to understand what they are saying, even though they say words have no meaning. In other words, they're contradicting themselves. They've already destroyed their own principle. They deny the rules of logic, but they have to use logic to deny logic as well as to promote their view. Again, they're being uh, hypocrites, they're being inconsistent. Remember, Ravi spoke uh, about his conversation with a postmodernist man who tried to defend the particular kind of logic that he believed they should be able to use, which is a both and kind of logic. You can have one statement over here and then you can have one that's completely contradictory to it and it's not that one or the other is true, but both of these things are true. 
But then after he spoke to this man for an hour, he pointed out to the man that he had been using the law of non-contradiction all during that hour to prove that the law of non-contradiction actually doesn't apply, it doesn't exist. Again, the logical fallacy. And of course, they deny the overarching truth that there is overarching truth and believe there are only individual truths, that they don't need to be consistent with one another, and yet they take all of their individual truths and they put it together into an overarching, coherent system of truth, which is what they deny. So postmodernism is, is, in a certain sense, self-refuting. Whenever they open their mouth to make any, any kind of a statement that makes any kind of sense at all, and they want you to understand it, they have to assume the, the truth of everything that they deny in order to do it. One postmodernist recognized that, in his, that inconsistency in his position when he said this, at the end of the day, I believe there is truth because I cannot deny truth and at the same time believe my denial is not truthful. <laughs> so pointing out the inconsistency the fact that they're basically, by their statements, by their assumptions, they're cutting off the branch upon which they're sitting. But now, this is just the first part of the defense. Remember that what Ravi Zacharias was doing was refuting postmodernism to Christians. Now, if we want to go beyond that to, uh, you know, to the unbeliever who is the postmodernist, we, we do need to go a bit further. And as I said before, uh, having refuted then their position, having uh, destroyed in their own eyes uh, their own basic presuppositions, having shaken them for the moment from that position, we need to show them the consistency of the biblical worldview. You know, why we believe words have meaning. I mean, why do words have meaning? It's not just because that's the, the way we grew up and that's the way we've been operating but because the God who created us actually gave us language, the ability to communicate with one another. You know, language was not something that Adam and Eve actually learned. God gave them the ability to speak from the very beginning. He gave them language. And when he divided the languages of the earth, he gave each particular culture their particular language. God gave us language so that he could communicate to us using words that have meaning, words that we can understand. Uh, we, we know that, that uh, what God tells us and the words that he uses have meaning, uh, and they can't be stripped of their meaning, because having spoken to us in his word, God holds us accountable for what it is that he has told us. Uh, think about this one example in John 15, 22, where Jesus, uh, speaking again in the upper room to his disciples, he says this, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Okay? Now, he's not saying sin in general, but the sin of rejecting God's Son, reject rejecting the Messiah, if Jesus had not demonstrated that he was the Messiah, if he had not spoken to them the things Messiah was to speak, they would be excusable for that. But now that he's spoken, they're not. Now, in the same way, God's having spoken to us in his word regarding who he is and his will for our lives leaves us without excuse because now we know what God desires. We know because words have meaning. Our justification for words having meaning is the scripture itself. Now, we also can show them why we believe in logic. And that's because we serve a God who is logical. God communicates us to us in a way that proves logic. For instance, when he says, I am the Lord, he can't mean at the same time that he isn't the Lord. He's saying one thing but not another, the law of non-contradiction. Something can't be A and not A at the same time and in the same relationship. So God proves the law of non-contradiction when he speaks to us. When he spoke and the universe leaped, as it were, into existence, he proved the law of causality. For every effect, the creation, there is an antecedent cause, which as we look 
at, at the theory of evolution, we're going to see that cause has to be sufficient for the effect. There is a cause and effect relationship. And again, scripture proves it. And when Jesus did miracles to show the power of God and people saw it and they were terrified and they paid attention, he proved the basic reliability of sense perception. What I saw really actually took place. These are things that postmodernists deny. Law of non-contradiction, law of causality, basic reliability of sense perception. And we also show them why we believe that there is an overarching truth and not just individual truths because we believe in the God of truth who will always tell us the truth and who will never contradict himself. So having shown them their inconsistency and the reason that we hold to what we do, the consistency that is within the biblical worldview and only in the biblical worldview, we can go on to use the other evidences that God has given to us, why we believe he exists through natural revelation. Remember, we saw the ontological, cosmological arguments this morning. There are many, many others. We'll see a couple more in just a few moments. Uh, why we believe the Bible to be God's word because of the many ways that it shows itself to be his word. And we continue to show them the consistency of our view with what we see and we know of the world. Again, our view, the biblical worldview, is the only consistent view because it's the only true view. So we argue against their position, show them the inconsistency of their basic assumptions, we show them the consistency of ours, and we demonstrate why we believe these things to be true, and that is because God exists. And really, that, I think, is at the crux of the presuppositional argument. The only reason why we're here and we can do the things we're doing and even talk about these things is because there is a God who exists, God exists, who gave us this ability. Okay. Now, remember that even if we are successful in our defense of the Christian faith and in demolishing the opponent's view, we need to remember it doesn't mean that our hearers are converted. And it doesn't mean that they will be converted, but it does mean that maybe we have gained a hearing for the gospel, and that is what they need to hear, okay? That is what God uses to save. Sometimes we don't have to offer an apologetic. Sometimes we can just tell them the gospel. I think we need to make sure we do that when we're trying to bring somebody to Christ. We have to make sure we tell them the gospel. So whether we use an apologetic, a defense, whether we need to do that or not, we need to make sure that we share that message. And we should share it whenever we find somebody willing to listen to it. Now secondly, let's consider another example that perhaps seems more relevant because many of us may not have actually rubbed shoulders with people who hold to the postmodern position, even though it is prevalent in our society and in our universities and, you know, just the way people function, but perhaps we're not coming in contact with them. But we do come in contact with many people today who believe the theory of evolution. And so we need to know how to defend the truth against that. Now, again, we, we, we basically do it the same way. Okay, they have basic assumptions. We need to attack those assumptions. We need to attack those presuppositions. Show the inconsistency of their position. And evolutionary theory has many of those inconsistencies. Now, evolution teaches, although it hasn't historically, it does today, that everything that we see, all matter, essentially came from nothing. I believe that was Stephen Hawking's position, the professor that just passed away. And he knows, of course, this isn't true anymore, but he believed it at this particular time, that there was nothing, there was a fluctuation of nothing, and suddenly everything just sort of leapt into existence. But the, the interesting thing is, it kind of shows a postmodern mindset, doesn't it? It doesn't have to be logical anymore. Anything can happen. Historically, man has, has accepted as an axiom, as something that really can't be denied, that out of nothing, nothing comes. So here's the first inconsistency of evolution. You can't explain the existence of everything. You can't have everything coming out of nothing. Evolution, secondly, requires a living 
organism, something that is alive, to modify, to start the upward climb from amoeba to man through a process of mutation and natural selection. Now, not only can the evolutionists not prove that all life came from a single cell, they can't prove that a single cell could spontaneously generate. As a matter of fact, all the evidence that we have points to the fact that this could never happen. You know, evolution, evolutionary theory basically arose at a time when we had such a primitive view of what it was going on in a human cell. If you've watched the, uh, the documentary that's called, uh, what is it, um, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed uh, by Ben Stein. Uh, it's interesting, they're, they're talking to a, a scientist, and it's not clear exactly where he stands, but he certainly doesn't agree with evolution. But Ben Stein asked him the question, if the concept of a cell during the time that evolution first started was that of a Buick, you know, that's what a cell was likened to, a Buick, he said, what would it be like today? And he said, a universe. Uh, there is so much going on in a living cell that we didn't know was going on, but now we know. And the question is, could that have just simply happened? Could it spontaneously generate? All the evidence says that is impossible. Evolution requires beneficial mutations, changes in the organism that add information to it, that push the evolutionary process forward. Now, some changes have been documented that give a, an organism an advantage in very narrow circumstances. For instance, bacteria, it's been shown, can become resistant to an antibiotic because of some change within that bacteria, but it's usually through a loss of information rather than through gaining information. I'm not sure they've ever proven that any bacteria gained information, but rather lost it, which means it didn't produce a protein that antibiotic was targeting, and that's why it survived. But it's also been noted that, that when the antibiotic is taken away and this same bacteria has to exist on its own with, with the normal bacteria, it, it doesn't do quite as well as its unchanged counterparts because it's lost some valuable information. It's kind of the same thing like sickle cell anemia is pointed to as a beneficial mutation because it gives those who have it uh, an immunity to malaria. Well, the problem is it, it may protect you from malaria, but it also shortens your life and you have these very painful episodes where you're crippled because it's, it's uh, detrimental to the organism. It doesn't help a person, it hurts the person. So again, where are the beneficial mutations that push uh, evolutionary uh, progress? Uh, evolution requires natural selection, the survival of the fittest. Now that actually does take place. Animals have particular advantages in certain types of environments and they're more likely to survive than those that don't have those advantages. But this is not the addition of information to the organism. Uh, this doesn't push evolution forward. It doesn't change one species of animal into another species. It merely removes information from the genetic pool that created the variations in the other animals. So. This one variation that's already there, the information expresses itself in the animal, gives it an advantage, and it survives in this environment. But that same animal might have another expression of something that's already in the genes that would help it survive in another environment. It doesn't add information. It just narrows the information down. And then speaking of information, <clears throat> I think the, the biggest obstacle, if there isn't already insurmountable obstacles for evolution, is they can't account for the vast amounts of information that are encoded on the DNA molecule that is in every cell of every living creature, enough to fill a thousand books, a thousand volumes, 500 pages each of complex chemical reactions, uh, a blueprint to build a particular creature. It can't account for the roughly 50% of the information that is, is really a collection of, of instructions on how to use the other 50% to build this particular creature. It can't account for the context in which this information that exists has meaning. I mean, this isn't just useless information that just sort of gets thrown into the world, but information that is understood, 
and information that is able to be put to use, and it doesn't account for the machinery that's necessary to read the information and actually use the information to build and maintain the kind of creature that the blueprints on the DNA molecule actually call for. Information. Information is the death knell of evolutionary theory. There's no way to account for the information, the context, the mechanism. And when you add to that uh, these other items here, it also can not account for the fact that the particular creature called man possesses qualities that none of the materials that he's actually made of possess, such as self-awareness, intelligence, the power to will, or morality. The question is, and, and I think this is probably one of the, the most direct ways to get to somebody who believes in evolution, ask them the question, do you believe that you can have something greater come out of something less? And the answer, of course, is if they understand the laws of logic and how things work, the answer has to be no. Well, then the, the uh, question is, well, then how could we come from the ground? Does the ground have self-awareness? Does the ground have intelligence? Does the ground have will? Does the ground have morality? Does the sun have it? The sun and the earth interacting supposedly caused us, supposedly we spontaneously generated and evolved from this, these particular materials. That's what evolutionary theory teaches. But how could that be if the cause of us does not possess these qualities? Now, once we've shaken them from their position, then we can share our position with them. We believe that there is an answer for how uh, matter came into being as well as time and space. We have a sufficient cause. That is an infinitely wise and powerful God. He's the one who created life. And he created life in a very short space of time. The fossil record bears out an explosion of life, fully formed creatures with no intermediate life forms. In other words, you look at the fossil record, you don't see amoeba to man. What you see is everything existing at once, all fully formed and no transitional life forms from one to the other. If evolution were true, you would find more transitional life forms by far than the final product, as it were. So the, the fossil record disproves um, you know, the, the idea of evolution, but it does prove what the Bible says that God made every creature according to its kind. He is an adequate explanation as well for the information we find encoded on the DNA molecule, the blueprint, the instructions, the context, and the necessary machinery to build and repair a living creature because he is a sufficient cause. He is able to do this. And he explains why we find within ourselves self-awareness, intelligence, the power to will, and morality because he who is the cause possesses these qualities. We are made in his image. Whatever caused us must have these qualities. But again, remember this, that this argument is not going to convert them, but the Lord may use it to shake them from their position long enough to take a close look at the gospel so that they might be saved. We can't argue anyone into the kingdom, but we can use arguments to point them to Christ and make sure that if, if you use these arguments to do that, that you bring the gospel in because these other arguments aren't going to save them. Now, finally, as I've said, I want to consider one last point um, briefly. What Jesus tells us is perhaps the most powerful apologetic or argument for God's existence and for the truth of his gospel and that is the love that it produces in our lives, a supernatural kind of love. Now, after telling his disciples in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another, which we saw, I think, a couple weeks ago, is not really a new commandment because in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, we find that we are to love our neighbors ourselves. Jesus gives it new meaning by showing us how to do that. So rather than saying, love your neighbor as yourself, we really should be saying, love one another, love your neighbor as Jesus loves his neighbor. Love one another as Jesus loves you. So this is the newness to the commandment. Well, after saying that, he tells them why he wants them to do this. He says in verse 35, 
By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I thought it was interesting because he says all men will know this, not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles. And they will know that you are my disciples, Jesus says, disciples of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, he tells us the same thing as he was offering up his prayer for the disciples in the high priestly prayer. Notice what he says in John 17, verses 20 through 23. Jesus prays, and he's praying not just for his disciples, but also for us. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, my disciples, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, it's going to go on to say what this means, that we may be, be, all be one. And he's talking about the love that, of the Spirit that unifies us together. That is the witness. That is how the world will know that the Father sent the Son into the world to be the Savior of mankind. He goes on to say this, The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. This, this love of the Spirit that creates this unity among the people of God is the witness that Jesus has actually given, that God has given to the world, not only as, as a defense or an apologetic for his existence, but that he sent his son Jesus to be the savior of mankind. Now, this apologetic, this defense, actually proved to be very powerful. Um, a very powerful witness to the truth of the gospel in the early church. We see this kind of love exercised after Pentecost in Acts 4, verses 32 to 35. Luke writes this, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him, that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all, for there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now, I, I should mention that this is not an argument for Christian communism, which some have said that it may be, but what was going on here was that the thousands of people that were converted at Pentecost, uh, they didn't want them just to go home without being discipled, and so they stayed in Jerusalem for a while to be discipled, and because they weren't planning on being in Jerusalem for such a long period of time, they had particular needs. But the point is, the congregation there was willing to meet those needs. They were of one heart and soul. They loved one another in the way that Jesus said we should love one another, as I, he says, have loved you. And the Lord used that testimony along with the miracles that were, was another defense we saw uh, this morning. Miracles are another apologetic for the truth of the gospel. And the preaching of the gospel, without which no one can be saved, to bring many people to himself. We read in Acts 5, verses 12 through 14. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And they were all uh, with one accord in Solomon's portico. And again, the one accord again means the, the unity that existed among them. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So again, the idea of, you know, the miracles, yes, of course, the preaching of the gospel, but also the witness or the testimony or the apologetic of this unity that Jesus said that would show the world that he had sent Jesus Christ into the world. Love is a very powerful apologetic. And think about this for a minute. Uh, maybe one of the reasons why 
the church is, is not able to bring as strong a defense of the gospel as they might otherwise because how can we tell others about the love of God for sinners if we're not willing to show that love to one another? We, we noted earlier that this is really the evidence that we belong to God in the first place, that we're in the family of God, is that we love one another in the way that Jesus prayed that we would, in the way he desires for us to, so that we would be that witness. John writes in 1 John 3.10, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now, the practice of righteousness certainly includes loving your brother, but John breaks this one out because he wants to, to bear, you know, uh, he wants to bear, well, show us particularly that this is a very important thing. As a matter of fact, this is what Jesus already told us is how all men will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another, our love for the brethren. So the point is essentially this. We, we do need to be equipped we need to be ready at all times to defend the faith, and we can do that in a variety of ways as we've seen. But I want us to be encouraged by this to pray for this particular defense of the gospel, that we might grow in our love for one another, in our love for our brothers and our sisters in the Lord, and also for um, basically that um, love for those who belong to other churches as well, right? Because... He's not talking about just what we do here, but he's talking about what the church as a whole is doing towards one another. So we need to pray that we might grow in our love for one another here, but also in our love for brothers and sisters that belong to other churches, uh, obviously Christian churches. And well, we need to pray too that the Lord might, as uh, again, John Frame, who um, when he wrote this book, uh, kind of lit a little bit of a, of a, of a storm there, you might say, or a, a, um, a, let's just say he rankled a number of people. He believed, because of this, that really the whole church should be one and we should just put everybody together and work out our differences. Now, maybe that's the way to do it. It seems like that would probably hinder us from doing anything else for quite some time. But certainly we should be working towards unity in the body of Christ. And we should express that unity whenever we see another brother or sister, even if they don't happen to be of our particular persuasion. If they're trusting Jesus, they are brethren. And we need to show the world that unity so that the world might have that argument or that apologetic that the Lord wants to show them. Now, at the same time, we also need to pray that the Lord would strengthen our love also towards others outside the body of Christ, even towards our enemies, so that when we interact with them and we demolish their, their assumptions and their presuppositions or we point out their sins so that we can bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we do it in a way that shows that we're really concerned for their well-being. Again, not just trying to win an argument and certainly not condemning them because of their sins. We need to remember what we were before we came to Christ and the mercy the Lord had on us, but to approach them and to deal with them in a merciful and gracious and compassionate way to show them the love of Christ. It's not going to help to stand on a soapbox and condemn them, but rather as, as it were one beggar showing another beggar where they can find bread. We need to be able to relate to where they were, have compassion on them, feel compassion like the Good Samaritan, and do what we can to reach out to them uh, with the gospel. So love, a very powerful apologetic. We need to pray that the Lord would strengthen our love. Well, let's, uh, let's do that now, shall we? As we um, close this time, let's bow in a moment of prayer and ask that the Lord would strengthen our, well, the work of his Holy Spirit to empower that love within us.